No, it's not. Please have a look at the number of countries which already have green economy projects at a national level in place already. We have uh, Barbados, Brazil, the state of Sao Paulo, Cambodia, green economy, China has actually put money where their mouth is and they have invested out of the last uh, res recession response in 2008. They invested something like $150 billion out of their total stimulus package, basically in green economy projects. And depending on how you count it, I mean, the official number is 211, but some of that is on you know, railroads into Tibet and stuff like that, which I don't count. But the fact is, there's a lot of investment in China in green the economy. In Indonesia, <coughs> there's a long-term green economy plan. South Africa has one. Well. So the idea is not just an idea, it's actually happening. And one of the reasons why I think it's taken on in these countries is because there was a sense of fear, there was a sense of concern that the old economic model was no longer delivering results to these economies. And part of that was because recession in 2008 had caused losses. It was palpable. It was, for instance, because of the lack of purchasing of flowers in, in European markets, and London especially, Kenyan flower farms were going bankrupt because one was connected with the other. Today's economy is connected, it's globally connected. You cannot avoid a recession in one place simply because you happen to be in another. And uh, I'm also happy that my ex-colleagues at the United Nations Environment Program are already in the dialogues, in addition to these countries, with another 20 countries <laughs> trying to get uh, programs going, which are basically transition strategies from the current economic model into a green economic model. So, Ladies and gentlemen, this is not theory. This is actually happening. Now, how did we approach it from the United Nations Environment Program? So we, we looked at the green economy in the following way. In terms of our focus, our strategy, the key sectors, the key business sectors of the economy, which we would have to pay attention to, to get the results that we wanted. And finally, demonstrate through a model, through an economic model, that it would actually be the the end result would be desirable. In other words, in terms of growth, employment, poverty, etc., we would actually have a healthy economy that we want. Our focus is, as I said, basically the key economic sectors. And why did we pick these? Well, we literally went through all of the major economic sectors <laughs> and asked ourselves the same question. Is it worthwhile investing money, changing the way these sectors work in order to hit those four buttons, in order to Take those four boxes of reduced ecological scarcity, reduced environmental risk, increased human well-being, and increased social equity. If at least three, or in some cases four of those boxes could be ticked by making particular investments in those sectors, we said, yeah, this is a particular sector. Let's include it in our study on the green economy. So that's how we selected these sectors. And in terms of our strategy, it was very much a cross-cutting strategy because we realized that. Ultimately, it is the private sector which is the main, largest part of the economy. They are the ones which will determine which way things go. But the private sector chases profits. That is the law of commerce. That is the way things work. And for them to chase profits in these opportunities, there has to be an opportunity which they believe in. There has to be the right enabling conditions or the right framework in terms of what are the subsidies, what are the taxes, what are the incentives, how will this work? Is there going to be stability enabling me to invest for the sake of argument in sustainable agriculture or renewable energy, or for that matter, you know, transportation of a particular kind, uh, waste management, etc., etc.? Will these enabling conditions change from what they are? Because today's enabling conditions certainly do not engender a green economy. According to the International Energy Agency, there are 550 billion dollars worth of price subsidies for fossil fuels. Price subsidies for fossil fuels, basically support for the purchase of fossil fuels. 557 billion, I don't know the number exactly, uh, the International Energy Agency. And these are largely uh, across 37 odd countries that they surveyed. So they didn't survey every nation, they surveyed a sub-selection of those. In addition to that, there's a study done earlier which says that there are 100 billion dollars of production subsidies, which means help provided to the fossil fuel industry in terms of refineries, licenses, etc. Add them up, $650 million. Now tell me, if you're supporting a particular industry to the extent of $650 billion per annum, 
Why would an alternative industry succeed? Why would you get success in renewables if you are subsidizing fossil fuels to such a huge extent? Or for that matter, if you are subsidizing agriculture, this is from the Food and Agriculture Organization, if you are subsidizing agriculture to the extent of $275 billion per annum, why, and given most of that is going towards uh, the current levels of the current forms of agriculture, largely intensive agriculture, why would that engender a change to sustainable farming? Or for that matter, if you're subsidizing, I can go on. I mean, the, the problem with these subsidies is that they're creating a tilted foot, football field. And that football field has to be flat in order for a green economy, uh, private sector initiative to work. So these are the enabling conditions, subsidies, taxes, incentives, <coughs> finance. Very important. These subsidies, these enabling conditions have to be right. And they cut across all of these sectors, whether we talk about agriculture, freshwater, fisheries, forests, manufacturing, waste management, buildings, sustainable cities, etc. But to begin with, let me just show you the, the final result of our analysis here, which is basically based on a model which has been used before. All we did was to make use of an old model, T21, threshold 21, and demonstrate that if you invested just a tenth of the amount that you're investing today, instead of investing it in the old model of the brown economy, if you invested it in a green economy, you would get certain changes happening. So here's what we did. Today, the total economy uh, is 65 or 70 trillion dollars. At the time we wrote it was 65 trillion. Gross capital formation, and by that I mean the total amount that is invested by the government and by private individual and private sector. Gross capital formation is about 13 trillion, which is about 20% of GDP. What we're saying is that if you only invest 1.3 trillion dollars, in other words, basically 2% of GDP. That itself, over time, and I'll describe the results to you, can make a change between seeding a green economy or not seeding one. So we're not talking about a huge amount of additional investment. We're talking about a change in the behavior, a change in investor behavior from the government side and from the private side of only one-tenth of what they do today. That sufficient, that suffices. That will be the seeding amount that we have to call it. And what we get as a result of that change is basically enhanced wealth, higher rates of GDP growth over time, decent employment, and lower poverty. I'll explain in more ways. But this is across uh, three horizons, three time horizons. There's an early one, which is basically 2015, there's 2013, and then there's 2015. And you can see that the demand of energy. Per, per person, but this is the per capita demand of energy, goes down substantially as a result of that small change that we are talking about on an ongoing basis. You can see that the freshwater demand goes down. You can see that the forest land increases, not decreases over time. And you can see that it's, it's a significant increase because a 21% increase in forest cover, as Tom would recognize, is actually quite dramatic. And finally, and I think that is the most important one, is this thing called the footprint which is basically the amount of land and near shore sea that the average individual consumes over its life, decreases dramatically. In fact, drops to almost half over this, these 40 years. Ladies and gentlemen, what we have here is a demonstration using a model which is well accepted around the world that yes, this small amount of investment, small in the context of the total gross capital formation, is actually sufficient to make these changes take place. We are here talking about redirecting 2% of global GDP away from brown economy investment into green economy investment, just to summarize. We're not talking about magic, we're not talking about new money, we're talking about reutilizing existing money. 